to be praised now and forevermore. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done in our lives for salvation through the precious blood of Jesus, for the gift of the Holy Ghost, our comforter and our guide. You've been our healer. You've been our strength. Everything we need, you have so generously supplied. Son, our Lord, speak through these lips of clay. Anoint us that the yoke would be destroyed today. And we'll take no credit for anything that you do, but we give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise through Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. Give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You would open your Bibles with me to John chapter 10. Very familiar verse that I probably don't even need to read. But we would uh, just share with you John 10 verse 10. And it simply says, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I want to talk to you about the abundant life through Jesus Christ. The abundant life through Jesus Christ. It is enough to say that through him we have life. But to say that that life is abundant is to speak of excessive, overflowing, surplus, more than enough, We do not just have a meager existence through Jesus Christ, but through him we have an abundant life. Now it goes without saying that when Jesus says at the beginning of this verse, the thief, he understands that practically every human creature has some knowledge and usually experiential knowledge because I think all of us at some point in our lives have had something stolen from us. So he uses a natural picture to expound a spiritual truth that if you know how the thief works, if you know what the thief does in the natural, then you understand the works of Satan in the realm of the spirit. The thief has no other purpose other than to steal. That's why he's a thief, because he comes to steal. He comes to take that which is not rightfully his. And when one takes that which is not rightfully his, he is either a thief or a robber. The thief is usually depicted as that one who does something in a nonviolent way. Uh, he bumps up against you in a crowd, and you don't even know your wallet is gone until you get to where you're going, and you reach for it, and it's not there. Uh, the thief is the person that you leave something lying around in your office or in your home, and uh, the next thing, it's missing. The robber is usually that person who will take a gun or a knife, and with a threat upon your life, uh, it will say to you that either you turn it over or I'm going to kill you. 
But whether you're talking about the thief that does his thing very subtly or the robber that does it in a violent way, the spiritual picture is Satan who attempts to strip the people of God of everything that is worth having. We have the misconceived notion many times of looking on people as being our enemy. But I believe it is Peter that lets us know that we should not be deceived that your adversary, your enemy, is the devil. And uh, it's not people. People are genuinely, uh, you know, they're not really genuinely bad within themselves. It's not an innate condition in the human family. But as I've said to you so many times, every human creature is susceptible to spiritual impulses. Either you will allow yourself uh, to be motivated, unctionized, and even filled with the spirit of good, which is the spirit of God, or uh, else you are open prey for the chief evil spirit who is the devil. And, and when uh, whoever that uh, comedian was, it Flip Wilson, that used to say, the devil made me do it. Uh, and usually things that people do that are evil, it's because the devil calls them to do it. When you are his servant, you are not even in control. Oh, so many times people try to talk about, you know, before I got saved, I didn't do this and I didn't do that and I didn't do the other. It wasn't that I was in such a bad shape and in a miserable life of sin uh, because I, I never sold my body, I never did this, I never did that. The only reason you didn't was because the devil didn't release a certain demon on you. If he had released that demon on you, that he released on those people that you see shooting up with dope, selling their body and doing everything else, you would act no different because you're no more powerful to resist demon impulses than anybody else. The only guard, safeguard that you have against the devil dragging you through the gutter is when you yield yourself to God and become filled with his spirit. Then and only then do you have a safeguard against the devil. He is an evil spirit. He is the chief evil spirit. He is your adversary. And one thing that he definitely is, he is a thief. He will steal everything that makes your life worth living. He comes to steal. He comes to kill. He comes to destroy. Now, anything that diminishes your life, you don't have to wonder where it came from. If it diminishes your life, it came straight from the devil. Third John 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. And I want you to know, and this may sound really controversial to you, but if you obey the word of God, you may come from the lowest rungs of poverty, but you do not have to stay there all of your life. You, you do not have to grow up talking about uh, that it's a family curse, that, that, that I'm locked into a poverty cycle and I can't get free. The thing is, most of us don't want to do what it takes in order to be free. It sounds difficult when you tell somebody who's got bills that they can't pay and got a job and they are barely getting by and you tell them that you owe the Lord the first fruit of your increase, the first 10%, you are to give it to the Lord as a tithe. Most people react to that uh, if they don't say it 
they think words that are really not used in everyday language because you're not going to tell me that I've got problems paying my bills and you want me to take 10% off the top and put it in a tithe envelope and drop it in the church? The preacher already got more than I got. And a lot of times, as I told the people this morning, you don't know what a person has done in order to get what they have. When I look back over 44 years preaching the gospel and about 40 years in a pastoral capacity, we're coming up, our next church anniversary will be the 27th anniversary. And I had 13 years over on Wilson Street at Holy Temple, really as co-pastor to my father. But see, what most of you don't know is that I wish all of those years I could have had the luxury of giving 10%. Because in order, and I know a lot of folk, they see this church, they see the, the worldwide television ministry of bountiful blessings, they wonder how did it get here? How was it done? Yes, through the generosity of people, but also, it never would have been done had I not been willing to invest not 10%, not 20%, but for many years, 40, 50, and 60% of everything that would come to me, I just turned it right back over to the church. And that's the way I have lived. And there's no way if God tells me he's going to bless me for 10%, and if I've lived the life 40 years of investing 40 and 60 and 70 percent, there's no way I could help but be blessed. Over 40 years, I've been seeding and seeding and seeding. And then one day somebody look up and say, ooh, look at where he moved. Look at what he paid. I could have done triple that because the seeds I've sown entitled me to never want for anything. And, and there's, no, there's no need, you know, there's no need in you getting angry because you won't obey the word. And then hear folk around you that's obeying the word. And the Lord said, prove me. I'll open you the windows of heaven. It can't come out fast enough through the door. I'll open the windows and pull you out blessings that you won't have room enough to receive. Look at somebody and tell them, don't get angry because other folk are blessed. You start doing what it takes to be blessed and it'll happen for you. Oh, hallelujah. The devil is a thief. One thing that he wants to steal, he wants to steal the word of God out of your, first he don't want you to hear it. And then when you hear it, he doesn't want you to obey it. He does not want you to put it into practice because he understands that the word of God, according to what Paul says, is quick and powerful. Now, quick doesn't mean like that. Quick means alive. God's word is alive. Anytime there is a living word inside of you, anytime you take a living word and give it back to a living God, you can't help but get what the Word says. Yes, Jesus said, the poor you'll have with you always. You know why? Because he knew that there were poor folk that would rather stay poor than to prove God. They'd rather stay poor than to test God. They'd rather stay poor than to believe he means what he says. It don't make sense to me. Here I am, everything I got, and I spent all my money on bills. Don't hardly have enough gas money to get to my job. 
and you're going to tell me to give 10% of that and I'm not making it now? That's because while you're dealing with the 100%, it's 100% without God. But when you give him his portion off the top, then he comes in with you and becomes the main partner in the business of your life. And he said, I'll take your 90% and I'll stretch that farther than you can stretch the 100. Oh. But the devil doesn't want you to live the abundant life. He wants you to sit back and criticize the people who are. What did I tell you earlier? Anything that diminishes your life is of Satan. Sin diminishes your life. Sickness diminishes your life. Poverty diminishes your life. But for this cause was the Son of God manifested that he might do what? Destroy the works of the devil. The devil want to diminish your life through sin. He want to diminish your life through sickness. He wants to diminish your life through poverty. And Jesus said, no need in you trying to form an alliance with Satan. He's a thief. Oh, y'all heard the story about the woman that found a beautiful snake. The snake was half dead. And she said, oh, this snake is so beautiful, he really can't be harmful to anybody. And he's almost dead. So she takes the snake nurses it back to health, loves that snake. And finally, when the snake is fully back to health and she's holding the snake to her bosom and he injects that fatal bite. And she said, after all that I've done for you, brought you back to life and you would have the nerve to bite me and kill me. And the snake said, you knew what I was before you took me in. <laughs> Satan is a thief. He only comes to kill, to steal, to destroy. I don't care how you think you're having a ball living with the snake, dancing with the snake, partying with the snake. One day, the fatal bite will come. One day, you'll realize that that pet evil is the thing that will ultimately destroy you. Jesus said, you got to watch him. He's a thief. He comes to steal. Young lady, he'll rob you of your beauty. Right now, you may be winning every beauty contest that's held in your city, county, state, and you're going national because of physical beauty. But you start messing with the snake. You'll be looking 15 years older than you are before you even get 50. He'll rob you. He'll steal your beauty. Hallelujah. He's a thief. That's his business to steal and to kill and to destroy. He'll destroy your good name. He'll destroy your reputation. He'll destroy your mind. 
He'll be walking around here looking like the picture of health. And counting butterflies on the back of your hand that don't exist. He'll destroy everything that you have that's worth having. Jesus said, beware of the thief. Comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I want you to live. My, 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 my. He wants you to have life. And not just life, but abundant life. Uh, I, I don't do, I don't like to criticize a lot of foundation days because uh, I don't want you to get me wrong. Uh, but that was a time when we were youngsters growing up in the Holiness Church. Uh, we, we just didn't think that people could be wealthy and be saved. Because we would read where, you know, hardly shall a rich man enter into the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say it was impossible. He just said it was hard. He said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. Well, in late years, the biblical scholars, uh, they explained that that when Jesus talked about the eye of the needle, that he wasn't talking about a sewing needle, Amen. but he was actually talking about the gate in the gate. Yes, During the daytime, Jerusalem, like other cities, had these giant gates, almost as tall as this building. And when they were open, caravans could go through. But after the time of commerce was complete, they would shut the big door. And only there would be a small door within the door. Big enough for a human being to walk through. But to bring a camel through, especially with him loaded, would be impossible. So they would have to strip him and take all of the packs off of his back. And after they took the packs off of his back, then the camel was still too tall to go through it. So they'd have to get him down on his knees. And once down on his knees unloaded, somebody could be in front pulling and another behind pushing. And they would squeeze him through the gate. And that's a beautiful picture there. That if you're going with the Lord, yeah, you, you, you can't carry a load. Uh, you, you got to unload some of the folk that you're running with. Yeah, you, you, you can't go running with some folk. Two can't walk together except they be agreed. And if you really want to go with Jesus, you got some friends and some buddies that you got to unload. You got some habits and some customs and some ideas that you got to unload. Then not only do you have to unload, but uh, you got to be humble, which is typified by getting down on your knees. And then you can squeeze your way through. Hallelujah. And the Lord lets us know in the Bible it's nothing wrong with a person being wealthy, but you got to not trust in your riches. Some people trust in their money. Others trust in their political connections. And some trust in so many other things. But the only way that you're going to be saved, you're going to have to put your trust in God and in nobody else. Well, let me go just a little extreme with you. I believe not only the needle eye gate, but I believe that the, through the power of God, he can bring a camel through a sewing needle. Because the God I serve, there's absolutely nothing that's impossible with him. There's nothing that he can't do. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we used to think that. We thought that for a person to have a certain amount of money, they, they was too rich to go to heaven. And uh, good-looking folk, they, they had to dress down. Huh? And, of course, there was a no-makeup policy. 
That was a long dress policy. And if by chance you saw at the end of the dress that was the cotton stocking, and that was the uh, doing nothing to the hair policy, you couldn't use a straightening comb. Later on, they began to let them use the straightening comb. But we, we thought that being poor and, and, and looking haggish, for lack of a better word, was the way to prove that you were sanctified. And we always knew who was deep. Because the meaner the look, the, the more we thought you were consecrated. And you, you dare not dance or praise God with a smile on your face because, you know, they're not for real. They're faking. So we thought it was all about looking ugly, looking bad. But I want you to know, God doesn't care anything about how good you look. He wants you to look good. He wants you to smell good. Yeah, he wants you to enjoy the best that is in life. When he says, prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospered. In other words, he's saying keep things even. Don't have a whole lot of money and good health and don't have a relationship with God. Because you can have money and good health, but if you don't have a relationship with God, your money and your good health won't do anything but send you in the wrong direction. But if you prosper and be in health and don't allow that to outdistance your soul's salvation, then God can trust you. And he knows that whatever his body, the church needs, you'll understand that he blessed you with wealth in order to establish his kingdom. See, a lot of folk don't understand why God blessed you. You think God blessed you to party with your friends, but he blessed you in order that his kingdom might be established. Amen, somebody. So when we yoke up with Jesus, Turn away from the thief who only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And put your trust in him. Listen to how he says it in uh, Matthew chapter 6. He said, now, don't be preoccupied with what you're going to wear. Because you've got to consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Hallelujah. Even Solomon in all of his glory, he wasn't dressed up as beautifully as a lily. Oh, glory to God. Don't even think about the halves on your head. Don't get so preoccupied with the right wig. And now it's the weave or the transplant. Hallelujah. He said, because when you get through worrying about the halves on your head, he said, I got all of them numbered. I know how many strands you got. I know how many you got from nature and how many you bought. God said, I know about the halves on your head. It don't matter what you do. You, you can't even, you can even go out and buy some what the young fellas were wearing years ago, platform shoes. But when you get off those platforms, you still shout it. You can't add not one cubit to your stature. He said, but let me tell you what to do. Matthew 6, 33 says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Say, God knows the things you have need of. He knows you live in a material universe. He knows you've got to have things. But don't go seeking after things. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things 
shall be added unto you. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. The thief comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. But Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life. I wish you'd look at somebody and tell them God wants you to live. Oh, that, that's the story that comes across even in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel when the Lord talks to Jerusalem. Let me just read that. Again, the word of the Lord, I'm in chapter 16, came unto me saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. Say, thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite and thy mother an Hittite. In other words, you came as a product of mixed birth. Your father was one thing, your mother was something else. And any time you are a product of a mixed marriage, yeah, you're going to have some problems because people on both sides are going to reject you. He said, as for thy nativity in the day thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither was thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou was not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied thee to do any of these things unto thee, to have compassion upon thee, but thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. I hear somebody saying, Preacher, I hear your message, but you just don't understand uh, that I was born under a curse. Yeah, I, I, I'm born under a family curse. Nobody in my family have ever succeeded. Somebody said, Well, certain diseases were in my bloodline. And my mama died with it. My father died with it. My brother and my sister died with it. So here I am. I'm just a hanger on. I might leave here any day because from the day I was born, a death sentence was hanging over my head. The Lord said, you were cast out. He said, but when I passed by and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou was in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou was in thy blood, live. Look at somebody and tell them, you might feel that death has surrounded your house, that death is knocking on your door. But I hear God saying to you, live. You, you don't have to die. Disease may be in your body, but you can still live. Yeah, it may be a pack of bill collectors like a pack of wolves that are on your heels and you feel like uh, it's driving you up a wall and, and, and you feel like you're going to have a nervous breakdown. But in the midst of all of this confusion, I can still hear the Lord saying, live. You don't have to die no matter what your situation is. Jesus said, I came in order that you might Oh, I just wish you'd look at somebody and just tell them, the Lord said for you to live. Oh, I'm going to quit. Hallelujah. The thief wants to steal. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy. He wants to diminish your life. But I hear the Lord Jesus saying, you're in a race. Death is on your track. You've fallen down and death is trying to reach. But I hear Jesus in the grandstand saying, live whatever you're going through, live. I just wish you'd get up and, and just tell seven people. I don't care if you've got to move out of your place. Just tell seven people, God said live. Hallelujah. Yeah. Live. The Lord said live. The Holy Ghost said live. Ah. I'm 
going. I'm going to my seat. But I know you are knowledgeable of that story in the book of 2 Kings where there were four leprous men starving to death. The Syrians had besieged the city of Samaria and it was so bad that food couldn't get in and the starving folk couldn't get out. My God. Syrians were camped out in the hills and they had that tent stretch with all kind of food. But here these Israelites inside of the city of Samaria were dying from hunger. The Bible said it was so bad until they were selling uh, even the dove's dung, the body waste of a pigeon for so much money people were eating everything. Two women even conspired to eat their own sons. One night they decided to cook one of them's son, but the next night the other mother hid her son. And when the king walked by on the wall and said, what's going on? And the mother told that gruesome story. The king ripped his raw purple and underneath he was wearing sackcloth and it looked like death was going to invade the city. But in the meantime, there were four lepers sitting up in the hills. They looked toward the city and said, no need in going there. Because they give us a chance at life. But if we sit here, we know we're going to die. So they said, why? Sit we here till we die. If we're gonna do anything, we better move in the direction where it seems we've got a chance of life. I want to say to you that are dying in your sins, dying, you can't help yourself. Your money is already funny, but you're throwing it away down the road in the gambling casino. Dying. Sickness is in your body, and the doctor haven't given you a good word. Dying and don't know what to do. I hear the word say, why sit where you are? Why sit there till you die? Get up and start moving by faith. Get up, start moving to him that's got life in his hand. Get up. Jesus, he said, I will give you life, abundant life, life in the spirit, life that the devil can't steal. Come on and tell somebody, neighbor, I'm not going to die, but I'm going Why are you standing? Glory to God. Why are you standing? There are in this building now at least 75 souls whom the Lord is speaking to. In just a few moments, I'm going to let the audience be seated. But when they sit, you that know you're lost in sin, don't you dare sit. But I want you to remain standing and start moving this way. Lost in sin, dying because the thief has stripped your life. I don't want you to sit either. But I want you to start moving in this direction. Those of you that know you're saved and the Spirit of God is dwelling richly in you, you may be seated, but I'm going to ask the rest of you to remain standing, you that's lost in your sin, and come on down here right now. Come on now. Come in a hurry.